It's a great pleasure to be here, and maybe I'll figure out how to speak into the microphone along the way. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking the, uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's great to have this opportunity to present some of the work I've been doing the last couple of years. Um, I'd like to mention at the outset that a lot of that work has been done jointly with Suno, uh, who will be maybe known to many of you, and he's been a regular uh, participant in this conference uh, this year, unfortunately, he's not here. But um, if at the end of this there's any credit due, then you should have to it, a lot of it too soon. So, um, how do I switch this? Ah, find out too. The main points, I want to make um, three main points today. The first is that aggregate demand policy may be needed in the long run. That may not be contentious. The second is that with a sensible fiscal policy, by that I mean a fiscal policy that maintains full employment, then the long run debt ratio depends on the rate of growth, the rate of full employment growth. And in particular, if the rate of full employment growth is low, you may need high debt. The debt ratio also depends on government consumption, and perhaps paradoxically, if you have high government consumption, you will need only low debt. And then it depends on the degree of inequality insofar as inequality affects saving. If you have high inequality, you may need a lot of debt to maintain full employment. What that leads up to is uh, an argument that policy debates and policies have been misguided. So. Quick outline. I will start out, even though it's late in the day, I'll start out with some simple algebra, which I think is important. Um, that piece of algebra leaves open um, at least one degree of freedom. And so after the algebra, I'll talk about theory and how you can close that degree of freedom in different ways. I'll talk a bit about a mainstream closure and I'll talk about a functional finance perspective. And then that should leave time to talk about secular stagnation. Um, I may skip the bit about Japan if, if I'm pressed, but I do hope to comment on Summers, Krugman and others who have recently sort of uh, contributed to this literature on secular stagnation. Throughout, I'll be talking about a closed economy, so nothing that's directly applicable to, to Greece. I'll talk about a mature economy, and by, by that I mean an economy in which the full employment growth rate is well defined. So it's not a perfectly elastic labor supply so that growth can be at any rate. There's a full employment growth rate that I'll take for simplicity as given equal to N. It could be endogenized in some, in some ways. The important thing is we do not have a completely elastic labor supply. Okay, get started. First equation up here should be very familiar. That's the, oh, I apologize. Um, I think there's some compatibility issues. So the, uh, the slides that were, that were printed somehow left out all the equations. The new correct slides are online and can be downloaded, so don't panic if you, if you find it interesting. Okay, so the first equation here is the goods market equilibrium. C equals I, Y equal to C plus I plus G. I have divided through by the capital stock since if we're talking long run growth, it's useful to normalize in this way. Second equation, government consumption. I will take as exogenously given the ratio of government consumption to the capital stock. Of course, the precise level of that is extremely contentious. Debates about how large should the public sector be, how much should it spend on education. For my purposes, those are 
not fantastically relevant, so I'll just keep it exogenous here. I think the question of functional finance can be phrased without discussing, without getting into those conflicts. Third equation, kind of straightforward accounting. If you want to have full employment growth, that means growth at the rate N, and if you have depreciation at the rate delta, then in steady growth, your output capital ratio needs to be equal to N plus delta. And then the last equation is the output capital ratio, which I will allow to depend on the interest rate, a choice of technique. If you don't like a choice of technique, then in fact, it's not particularly relevant to the main point I make, but it's, it's interesting to have it because it is important in, in mainstream stories. If you take these equations, you can uh, now rearrange the initial equilibrium condition. And that will give you a, an equation that describes the required level of private consumption relative to the capital stock. I've just plugged in the other equations. And you can now ask different questions. Is this condition satisfied automatically through market adjustments? In other words, will markets automatically make it possible to have full employment growth? This is the condition for full employment growth. If that adjustment happens partly through variation in the output capital ratio, you can ask whether these adjustments would lead to a capital intensity that in some sense is socially optimal. Or more generally, you can ask just what determines the consumption capital ratio. Before I proceed, maybe I should mention some possible Kaleskian objections, or maybe it's just a kind of distinction between what Eckhart did and what I'm doing here. I don't have here endogenous utilization rates of capital. In my view, in the long run, if you have steady growth, capacity utilization is best viewed, at least as a first approximation, as just equal to the desired rate of utilization, which I'll take as being roughly exogenously given. So utilization rates I do not allow to vary. I have the natural rate of growth here as a given number n, so we are not in the world that Eckhart described in which, in which you have labor supply is just completely accommodating no matter what the growth in demand, labor supply accommodates. Again, I think the exogenous n is a better benchmark, it's simple, but it's a better benchmark for me. So there's a disagreement here. And then I will have interest rates and choice of technique at least a little bit. And you may say that falls foul of the capital controversy. I don't think that's true. I don't think the capital controversy means there's no choice of technique. There's more than one technique. Firms can choose different techniques. I don't think the capital controversy shows that the cost of finance, the interest rate, does not influence the choice of technique. I think it does. And so just having that does not violate anything in the capital controversy. But anyway, these are just to indicate differences. Um, let's get back to now the question about will consumption automatically get to what is required. And let me first take the perspective of a DSGE model. So you have here Ramsey optimization, representative consumer maximizing with infinite horizon. In that story, you do have a unique natural rate of interest, determined basically by household preferences. You also have that capital intensity will adjust to what is socially optimal, taking as the welfare criterion the household's utility function. And you have that the saving rate will adjust so as to allow full employment growth. That's the simple story. It means there's no need for fiscal policy in this world, which is good because, in fact, fiscal policy is completely ineffectual. We have Ricardian equivalence. And what policy should do in this model would be to engage in tax smoothing insofar as we don't have non-distortionary uh, lump sum taxes to rely on. How robust is this, is this result? The answer is it's incredibly fragile. You can stay with perfectly rational utility maximizing agents everywhere. You can assume rational expectations. You can impose full employment. 
Make all those assumptions and you still don't get the results if you have finite lives and finite horizons. In that case, you may not get what is the socially optimal output capital ratio if you want to have full employment. This is well known. It's known from OLG models. It's not something I invented. Mainstream people should know it. There's no reason to get the optimal output capital ratio. If you insist on getting the optimal output capital ratio, whatever we deem that to be, then in general you will not have full employment growth as a possibility. Fortunately, in these models, once you have finite horizons, you do not have no Ricardian equivalence. You do not have Ricardian equivalence. You have no Ricardian equivalence, which means that now we can use fiscal policy. If we do that, an appropriate starting point would seem to be that of functional finance. Use monetary policy, use the interest rate to get whatever you deem to be the optimal capital intensity. If there's no choice of technique, just set the interest rate whatever else you want to, I mean, wherever you want it to be. Now it's set, now we have the, the capital intensity determined. What you do afterwards is you use fiscal policy to maintain full employment. You set taxes so as, and taxes now will influence consumption demand, so as to make sure that you have full employment. That leads to variations in taxes over time. And as a result of that, you will get the public debt evolving in some manner. Intrinsically, the public debt is neither good nor bad. It's an instrument. We use fiscal policy to maintain full employment. Simple example. Write the consumption, level consumption, as a function of disposable private income and private wealth. For simplicity, take private wealth to be the sum of physical capital plus government debt. Government debt is private wealth. That's the second term. First term is disposable income, which has output plus interest payments from the government to the private sector and then subtracting taxes. If you take that consumption function, if you combine it with a simple accounting equation for how does the debt evolve, and if you now make sure that you adjust taxation so as to, main full em so as to maintain full employment, then you can figure out what's gonna happen to debt. Notice that at any moment in time, full employment output is given the debt is given, so B is given, RB is given, the capital stock and the debt stock are given at any moment. So the only thing on the, on the right hand side that can vary is the tax rate or the taxes, the level of taxes which we can adjust and they will affect consumption. So change taxes to get to full employment and then we'll see what happens. And what happens is that the differential equation we get for the debt capital ratio turns out to be stable. The debt capital ratio and thereby the debt income ratio will not be diverging. It will be converging towards a stationary state. Why is that? Well, it's because we have negative feedback effects from the level of debt to the change in debt. If debt goes up by a little bit, then that raises private disposable income. Why? Because the private sector gets interest payments on that debt. We want to maintain consumption where it was because that's full employment level consumption. So we need to compensate by taxing the private sector to offset the increased income. We also have that the increase in private wealth would tend to increase consumption. We cannot allow that to happen because we don't want overheating, we want to maintain full employment, so we need to raise taxes. In other words, as debt goes up, we need to raise taxes and thereby reduce the deficit, and that stabilizes the path for the debt income ratio. It converges to this expression here. Often long expressions like this are just hideous and hard to interpret. 
but there are some interesting parameters and uh, exogenous variables in this expression. If you look first at n, n was the growth rate. It appears both in the numerator and the denominator. Negatively in the numerator, positively in the denominator. That means unambiguously an economy that has a slow rate of growth of full employment income will need a high debt ratio. Look at how gamma, gamma was the, the government consumption to capital ratio, how that enters. It enters in the numerator, enters negatively. If you have a high level of government consumption, then in the long run you get a low debt income ratio. And then of course you have the saving rate that enters in both numerator and denominator and not surprisingly if you have a high saving rate or a low value of C then that will tend to give you a um, high debt ratio in the long run. When you get results like this you want to see if there's a simple intuition. The basic structure is very simple. So what is that's happening? And once you think about it, there is a very simple intuition. Look at the equilibrium condition again here. If you increase either the growth rate of the economy and thereby the necessary investment, or you increase government consumption gamma, then since you want to maintain a given level of full employment income, you need to squeeze consumption. How do you do that? You do that by raising taxes and reducing the deficit, and thereby getting a lower public debt in the long run. So quite intuitive. What seemed paradoxical, high government spending leads to low debt. In fact, once you think of it as we need to maintain full employment, becomes quite intuitive. Higher inequality, insofar as it raises the saving rate, then the saving rate has gone up. What do we need to do? We need to bring back consumption to the full employment level. So what do we need to do? We need to reduce taxes to stimulate consumption. And then, um, I'll skip the... Discussion. I think one, one little aspect here is particularly interesting, and that's the, uh, the link between growth and, um, and debt ratios. You may recall this very famous paper by Reinhard and Rogoff, where they claimed that if you have debt ratios over 90%, then the levels of growth will be almost 4% lower. Uh, paper that was used by countless politicians to justify austerity policies. You may also recall that, in fact, the dramatic finding was based on simple, simple uh, spreadsheet errors. Thomas Herndon, a graduate student from UMass Amherst, who tried to replicate the study, discovered that they had just made very simple errors. So there's, there's, no, there's no threshold like this. It's not as if there's a cliff, and if you have debt <coughs> over that, then, then growth is much, much lower. But even after the correction, you do tend to find in the data a negative correlation between debt ratios and growth rates. The key question, if you see this, this kind of correlation, is about causation. It was interpreted by a lot of politicians, many economists, as high debt causes low growth. But in fact, what we have here is an argument, a theoretical argument, that if you conduct sensible fiscal policies, then in fact, if you have for some reason an economy with a low natural rate of growth, then you want to have high debt. We have unambiguously in this model causation going from the growth rate to the debt ratio and not the other way around. Another question that could come up here is, is whatever happened to the Lucas critique? You had this, I find this in some ways almost hilarious. You had a, a profession which, with the Lucas Revolution, decided that we cannot trust anything like, like simple correlations. We need to have theory and choice theoretic foundations and base everything on that. And then you have a, a, a policy debate and policy recommendations 
based exclusively on very simple-minded correlations and with not any attempt, serious attempt to link it to theory, and in fact with conclusions that find no support in the basic, um, in the work, uh, workhorse model of, of mainstream economics. You may ask, how, how robust are the results that I showed you? It was a very simple, a very simple structure, a couple of equations. And I think the answer is that it's very robust. As soon as you abandon the infinite horizon and you have this single consumer maximizing up to infinity, as soon as you abandon that, you need not even abandon optimization, although I may want to do it for households, but you don't need to do it. As soon as you abandon that, you get something along these lines. Similar results have been derived in traditional Keynesian models Eckhart Schlicht has a wonderful paper from Metroeconomica 2006. In fact, what he's doing there is very similar to what I put up here. Uh, with Sun Ryu, I've been examining both neoclassical and Keynesian OLG models, deriving very similar results. Uh, what is a Keynesian OLG model, you may ask? Well, I can't tell you here, but read the paper if you want to find out. Um, we've derived it in Sun and I again in stock flow consistent models of a corporate economy. One question you might have is, well, I put wealth as being just physical capital plus bonds, but of course households do not directly own machines, they own equity and they own bonds. So what happens if we complicate the whole story and, and in, distinguish between firms and households? Well, we get similar results. We can also complicate, extend the argument. Um, so far I said, what are the requirements for us to maintain full employment growth with the full employment steady growth rate being given? But you may ask a more interesting question, namely how do you conduct a fiscal policy that helps both to stabilize in the short run, which may be needed, and guides the economy along a full employment growth path? And here there's uh, papers, including one by, by again, Sun and me, and Rainer Franke has another, another very nice paper on that. Empirical relevance, um, is there any evidence that, that uh, policy ever was conducted in rough accordance with a functional finance perspective? I think there is. Of course, uh, politicians do not engage in perfect functional finance. Austerity policies should tell us as much right now. But I think there is a tendency, or has been a tendency in the past, for fiscal policy to react to unemployment. A kind of dirty functional finance. If there's high unemployment, you do tend to see deficits developing, partly through automatic stabilizers and partly through, through a discretionary policy. Can one, can one examine that kind of dirty functional policy, uh, dirty functional finance policy against the, the other kind of more mainstream Fiscal policy is kind of arbitrary, and then uh, if you have expansionary fiscal policy and debt developing, then you will get capital, private investment being squeezed out, capital stock gets lower, and you get high interest rates. That would be the alternative. And so what I did here was to just uh, put up a simple, a simple uh, uh, scatter diagram here with on the horizontal axis it's for the U.S. economy, uh, the debt to GDP ratio, which in the U.S. has varied a lot over the post-war period. So actually we have a wide variation to look at. You also have interest rates with a fair amount of variation in it. And remember the sort of non-functional finance view. Politicians make arbitrary fiscal policy decisions, and when they make the wrong decisions, we get crowding out. That view would suggest that we should have had the scatter plot around a positively sloped line. The functional finance view would say, no, we want to have a flat scatter around something that's basically horizontal. We conduct fiscal policy so as to maintain full employment with a given real rate of interest. And when I look at this diagram, you could do it with other interest rates basically the same the same story. When I look at that diagram, there's no doubt to my mind that this is much closer to a functional finance depiction than it is to the alternative. We do not find the positive correlation between debt and interest rate that uh, would have been the result. 
Um, hi, how, how um, am I doing? You have about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Um, let me then say a little bit about Japan. Uh, Japan is interesting, of course, because uh, it has been, been uh, in stagnation for a while. Um, and some, almost everybody who has written on secular stagnation has ref have, have referred to, uh, to Japan. So let me give you here just uh, growth rates in GDP per capita for Japan for three periods. You have the miracle years from 45 to 70 with 8.2% growth. And then you have the sort of middle period from 70 to 90 with 3.6%. And then afterwards, you have the almost now 25 years of low growth. <coughs> How would we explain that? Well, I think, I think uh, this pattern fits very well with the kind of Keynesian story. Um, up until 1970, the Japanese economy had a lot of hidden unemployment. It corresponded to the perfectly elastic supply of labor story. So you could have very high saving rate you had very high growth rate, high investment that swallowed up the saving. You also had a catch-up potential, so it was not just, it was not just that, that workers, number of workers, but also technical progress was very high. Then from around 1970, the early 1970s, um, signs of maturity start appearing, labor shortages start becoming something that, that they're talking a little bit about. There's still pockets of, of hidden unemployment. You're still not a, at a full kind of labor supply constraint, but that, that uh, starts kicking in slowly over these, these, these years. Um, and then from, uh, from uh, the 90s, you have the structural demand problems associated with a low natural rate of growth and high saving. In the post-1970 period, I may add that the, the incipient aggregate demand problems were kind of covered up by both a rapidly rising trade surplus. There had been a deficit before. It was also uh, swallowed up partly by, by fiscal deficits that again were new in that period. Both of those kind of solutions were preempted uh, in the in the uh, 90s, uh, opposition, political opposition to deficits from other countries, and uh, reluctance to see the uh, debt ratio rise too much. So um, this basically is is um, from an analysis that um, Takeshi Nakatani and I and I did a Japanese economy back in the early 2000s, um, where we concluded that that yes. Um, the Japanese stagnation can be explained by high saving rates and slow population growth. So the proximate problem of the Japanese economy may be aggregate demand, but in fact we have here a structural deficiency. It was, we didn't use the term secular stagnation, we think we talked about a structural liquidity trap, but it's basically the same thing. This is in contrast to standard uh, views. I, I looked up before coming here the latest OECD economic survey and they're still talking about how Japan needs bold structural reforms of labor markets. They need to rein in their pension and long-term care plans because of the unsustainable public, public debt. So they need to reduce the public debt. This seems to me precisely wrong. It seems to be a misdiagnosis of the problem. But of course they've been saying something similar for a long time. Secular stagnation, I think I'm running close to my time. Let me just say that I think there's a lot of good stuff. Good stuff in the sense that now we have mainstream people acknowledging that aggregate demand problems can be more than just temporary. We should applaud that, that's great. The problem is that, in my view, as far as I can understand what they're saying, their, it, their understanding of the problem is still fairly incomplete. They're still talking about how, how um, the government cannot indefinitely expand its debt, so that's a problem for fiscal policy. Krugman says, yeah, we have a long-run debt problem. Obstfeld even goes as long as to say that Japan's case illustrates how dangerous it can be to tolerate large public debt builds up, build ups. Gets it completely wrong. The debt buildup is not the cause, it's the consequence. And in fact, they should have been even more willing to build up debt. 
Where's the theory in all of these statements? It's interesting that even the people now who are critical of the mainstream DSGE models, and I think most of these people would consider them irrelevant, they don't actually provide much in the way of an alternative framework. Summers talks about the equilibrium interest rate. The equilibrium interest rate is well defined in a Ramsey model. It's unique. But once you move away from that framework, there is no equilibrium interest rate independent of public policy, fiscal policy. The interest rate that would give full employment depends on gamma, it depends on the debt ratio. That's precisely the implication of the simple exercise I gave you earlier. So when you talk about the equilibrium interest rate, there must be some either rejection of his framework, but I don't know what his framework is, or he is implicitly saying, hey, we need to have a debt capital ratio of zero or some other number. But why? Would that give us would that interest rate then give us a good capital intensity? Why do we believe that, that a functional finance view would be unsustainable? Why can we not use fiscal policy? As he suggests, we cannot because that might lead to something that's not sustainable. I don't think there are any answers to that. So, to conclude, don't ignore long-run aggregate demand problems. Full employment growth may require both fiscal policy and public debt. Don't consider arbitrary what would happen if we have this 3% primary deficit. What would happen? Is that sustainable? It may not be. If you start out with an arbitrary, stupid policy, you may get bad outcomes. Why would anybody want to maintain a 3% primary deficit? What you should do is ask what trajectory for taxes and implied public debt should we choose so that we can maintain full employment at the optimal capital intensity? That is the correct sort of learner way to approach it. If you approach it in that way, typically you will not get runaway debt ratios. You will find these, I think, somewhat interesting correlations that low growth leads to high debt. Austerity policies lead to high debt. Increasing inequality leads to high debt. So, rediscovery of secular stagnation, great, but it's a shame that, that they seem to be relatively blind to Keynesian post-Keynesian contributions.